Good afternoon. Uh, we are thrilled to be here today with a very special guest, Congressman Mondaire Jones of New York. My name is Stefan Lounger and I'm the director of the Bridges Collaborative. This event is being hosted by the Bridges Collaborative, which is an initiative of the Century Foundation, which is a think tank that among other issues like the economy and healthcare has done policy research in K-12 education with a specific focus on school integration for decades. The Bridges Collaborative is a cohort of 57 school districts, CMOs, and housing organizations from across the US that are working to create more integrated schools and neighborhoods. This event is being co-hosted by the National Coalition for School Diversity and the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. I will be co-moderating today's event with Matt Gonzalez. How's it going, everybody? Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Matt Gonzalez, he, him pronouns. I'm director of the Integration and Innovation Initiative at the NYU Metropolitan Center for Research on the Equity and the Transformation of Schools, a mouthful for the NYU Metro Center for short. I also serve on the steering committee for the National Coalition on School Diversity. Super excited to co-host this conversation. Thanks for being here, Matt. Today's conversation will be about segregation in our schools and our housing with a specific focus on the proposed bill, the Strength and Diversity Act, and other legislation before Congress with our very special guest, Representative Mondaire Jones, Democrat of New York. Before we begin, please remember that during the event, you may submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button, and a recording of this will be made available immediately following the event on tcf.org and the Bridges Collaborative website. So now let's let's uh, learn a little bit more about our guest, Representative Mondaire Jones, uh, who is serving in his first term as the congressman from New York's 17th district, encompassing all of Rockland County and parts of central and northern Westchester County. Uh, a product of East Ramapo Public Schools, Representative Jones was raised in Section 8 housing and on food stamps in the village of Spring Valley by a single mother who worked multiple jobs to provide for their family. After graduating from Stanford University, Representative Jones worked in the U.S. Department of Justice's Office, Office of Legal Policy, where he vetted candidates for federal judgeships and worked to reform our criminal legal system to make it more fair and equitable. Uh, he later graduated from Harvard Law School. As a member of the Judiciary Committee, Representative Jones continues his lifelong advocacy for civil rights and civil liberties and for the strengthening of our democracy. A flex for sure. Super excited to have you, Representative Jones. And I also want to note that Representative Jones made a forceful case for voting rights in an op-ed in the Washington Post earlier this week. Yes, you should read it if you have not. We know that among the rights we enjoy as Americans, the right to an equal education and the right to vote are some of the most fundamental. Congressman Jones, we are so pleased to have you here. Welcome. Thanks for having me here. And we're discussing an issue of obvious great importance for the American people and uh, that I have a personal connection to. And, and I'll start by just uh, introducing myself a little bit further. You know, I, I grew up in, in public schools and I know the value of diverse school districts uh, to ensuring that everyone in this country can be part of a multiracial democracy, right? I am who I am today. The reason I was able to transcend uh, poverty and those humble circumstances that you heard uh, and now be a United States Congress person at the age of 33 years old uh, is because of a quality public education that unfortunately is elusive for students in that same public school district today. Uh, and of course, due to segregation that exists uh, all throughout this country and indeed even throughout my congressional district, parts of Westchester and all of Rockland County and the uh, majority white affluent suburbs of New York City, uh, people are not able to have the same opportunities that I did when I was growing up. Uh, and that is what this fight is about. It is about equal opportunity and of course outcomes that are reflective of a civilized society where every kid deserves a quality public education and also exposure to the beautiful diversity that is the American public. Well, thanks, Rep uh, Representative Jones. You actually like led into our first que question, which was really getting a sense of, of what your what your educational experience was like. What were the schools like? What were the what's the community like? And so, you know, you talked a little bit about that, but we certainly want to invite you to to share a little bit more. Um, I think you know it's really important for us to think a little bit about. Um, everybody has a story of segregation or integration. I think most of us have a story of segregation. So it'd be really valuable to get a sense of 
you know, what kind of schools you attended, um, were they racially segregated, desegregated, integrated in any way? And how do you think that the, those experiences um, really shaped your trajectory to where, you know, to where you're at right now? Yeah. Uh, when I attended public schools in what's called the East Ramapo Central School District, they were integrated. And unfortunately today, those public schools are 97% black and brown. And we know that when schools are integrated, uh, largely due to the presence of, of white people, that, uh, that the school districts have more resources uh, to educate the, the public school students. There's more political capital uh, that exists within that school district when there is integration, um, where white people are present uh, within the population who uh, are, are able to, uh, are, are received, I think, better by, uh, by elected officials who uh, unfortunately still only pay attention to certain communities in this country. I've tried to change that in my own representation on behalf of my district going into communities that historically have been disenfranchised, uh, who I think appropriately feel like they have been left out of the political process and, and to be present and to listen and to be an advocate. Uh, but in too many communities throughout this country, that is still not the case. Uh, and so integration has that additional value uh, where you know there's a there's a there's there's political advocacy that occurs quite effectively, uh, and that's why you see those communities in part have more resources than non than uh, the majority well the non integrated communities of color. Thank you so much for shedding light on that, and, and I'm so glad you told us that these schools were integrated when you went them, and we've had a backslide, and so they're segregated now, and we've seen that all across the country. I mean today in 2021, one fifth of our public schools in America have almost no white children in them. Majority, they're 90% or greater black and Latino. Another fifth of our schools have almost no children of color in them. They're mostly white, 90% or greater white. And so we're in a place where we're in a worse off place today than we've been uh, in many, many decades. So I'm glad that you raised that point. I wanna turn us uh, to turn the conversation to the Strength and Diversity Act. So that's gonna be one of the focal points um, of our conversation today. It was actually introduced and passed in the House in the last session of Congress, um, where it was not voted on by the Senate, but it's back up for consideration this year. We know you're playing an integral role uh, in, 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 in shepherding that bill through Congress. Before we talk about the politics of it, could you just tell our audience what this bill would do? Absolutely, and, and I, I appreciate the, the, the slideshow -so presentation as well. I'm one of those visual learners. <laughs> um, let me start by saying I'm so pleased that this bill passed the House last year, and we got 20 Republican uh, voters uh, vote votes for this bill, and that's that is true bipartisanship in today's climate. Um, and I'm hopeful that the same will happen in the 117th Congress. I say that as a member of the Education Labor Committee, a fairly active member of that committee, uh, and I'm hopeful that this time around with Democrats controlling the Senate, uh, we will get a vote on this. And of course, we need our partners in the Senate uh, to be good advocates. And I will be helpful in that uh, with their colleagues and in, in making sure that, uh, that we pass this in the same bipartisan way that we did in the House of Representatives last term. This is something that uh, is unifying, this idea that a public education ought to be a quality public education and that schools ought to be integrated. And it is something that I hope is still possible in what is admittedly a, a more polarized climate from the last one. But one critical distinction is that you've got people now in control of the United States Senate who care very deeply about integration and about public school education. Uh, and this is legislation that would authorize the Department of Education to allocate funds to local educational associations, as we tend to say in our statutes, but really just local school districts uh, who have, you know, are submitting plans for integration uh, and the money could be used to, to study. It also could to, to study uh, segregation and or desegregation and but it's, it can also be used for the purpose of establishing things like public school choice zones uh, and and attracting uh, diverse students to an otherwise non integrated community. 
Well, actually, we want to get into a little bit of, of some of the politics here, because, you know, as you noted, there was a, a significant, you know, in, by today's standards, a significant number of Republicans who supported this this legislation. So I guess, you know, it'd be really valuable to get a sense of do you have any insight into the, you know, the, the strength and diversity's appeal to these members of the House? Do you anticipate bipartisan support again? And, and I guess, you know, you know, what what about this bill do you think uh, could be like, in terms of those who us, those of us who do advocacy, how can we frame this 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 legislation to appeal to a, a much more broad uh, sense of the electorate and and legislators? You, you know, conservatives conservatives frequently frequently talk about uh, the need to study hard and um, and that that will that investment will uh, pay dividends, and so here we've got an entire student population throughout this country that uh, if given the opportunity to have a quality public education uh, would be doing precisely what conservatives uh, have been telling everyone that they should be doing. So I, I think I think there's appeal in that to my Republican colleagues. Um, it is something that I think organizations need to reinforce in their advocacy. Uh, and of course, it is something that is an American idea. And, and it's why I think it was unifying to the extent of getting 20 Republican votes in the last Congress on top of uh, the Democratic votes that were necessary for this to pass. Uh, and so I think, I think framing it in terms of, look, people just wanna get a quality education. Um, it can be transformative for kids who grow up in different circumstances, particularly for um, kids who grow up in, in, in humble circumstances, like I grew up. And of course, we also know in a country that is increasingly polarized along racial lines, that getting to know people from different backgrounds is, in the social science does bear this out, uh, is critical to reducing uh, racism and racial resentments and the lack of understanding that I think has contributed to um, the polarization that we see today in our politics. I say this as someone who lived through the violent insurrection led by white supremacist domestic terrorists on January 6th. Well, thank you so much for that. And we're, we're glad to see how well-versed you are in the research that backs up the benefits of integration. We hope, we hope uh, your fellow Congress men and women are as well. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to, to jump to really quickly is, is one of the things that we think is most exciting about the Strength and Diversity Act uh, is the priority it would offer to projects that demonstrate meaningful coordination with local housing agencies to increase access to schools that have a disproportionately low number of low-income students. So we're trying to partner with housing agencies to essentially make integration more of a reality for students. Why do you think uh, that connection with housing is so important? Uh, the connection with housing is so important because we know that housing is in this country is deeply segregated along racial lines. And we know that in the vast majority of situations where you live determines where you go to school. Um, what resources economically and socially are available to you? Um, what outcomes you'll have later in life, professionally, educationally, and otherwise. And so it makes sense for uh, partnership to with 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 housing organizations and, and, and folks doing housing work uh, to be a very top priority for school districts actually interested in integration. It's uh, you know on the flip side, it's why you see communities resistant to to integration uh, accomplish those sinister goals through uh, through zoning laws and ordinances uh, and and other efforts to keep. Uh, affordable housing out of there, out of the municipalities, uh, which Westchester is no stranger to. I say this as someone who represents Westchester. Uh, there are fights ongoing today over this, unfortunately. Well, thanks for that 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 that, that kind of context and and that nuance that I think often gets lost in some of these conversations. I want to kind of move us to uh, like what, what what many of us see as a, a really significant opportunity. So the American Recovery Act was just passed last month and included $1.9 trillion in spending, including $123 billion for school reopening, $5.5 billion for summer school, after school, 
and technology for K-12 schools. This is for, for I, I think, every district, but also, you know, here in New York City for an, a, a system like ours, an incredibly significant infusion of resources. One way that we've really thought about integration in the city is not just about moving bodies around, um, certainly looking at admissions policy, zoning policy, but also thinking about what a place-based solutions, what are the conditions need to look like, and have actually used a framework by uh, designed by young people called the five R's of real integration, which looks at race, uh, race racist enrollment policy, the ways that resources distributed, um, the relationships, uh, curriculum and culture that happens inside of schools, uh, the representation of faculty and staff, and actually the, the, the restoration of discipline policies that really facilitate the school to prison pipeline. So as we're thinking of this somewhat broad kind of comprehensive um, set of priorities, do you think there are any, you know, anything in particular you want to highlight for the practitioners out there um, related to the, the this infusion of resources that will be coming that uh, that you are you may be particularly excited about or optimistic about in this bill anything you think can be leveraged to foster more integration the american rescue plan is the most transformative economic legislation for working families in modern american history uh, at, at 1.9 trillion dollars we are already doing so much uh, not least of which cutting child poverty in half through an expanded refundable and cash advanced child tax credit, which we need to make permanent, by the way, and, and, and folks like myself and Rosa DeLauro, the chair of the Appropriations Committee are fighting to do precisely that. Uh, you, you've got, you know, in, in, in my district alone, governments like Westchester and Rockland getting hundreds of millions of dollars all in in direct municipal aid, but perhaps most exciting. Um, as someone who is, like I said earlier, a proud graduate of public schools, is the many hundreds of millions of dollars um, that, well, congr congressional districts like mine are getting where one of my school districts is getting a over $150 million. That same school district that I grew up in that maybe a month and a half ago announced that it would have to cut mid-year approximately 32 teaching and other staff positions and consolidate classes. It's getting over $150 million. That is 65% of its annual school, of the annual school budget in that district. Uh, and this money is uh, quite flexible. Uh, and, and in addition to it being used over a multi-year period for safe reopening, uh, it can also be used to address le so-called learning laws. Um, and, and, and by the way, that includes investments in technology. We know that People are being asked to distance learn without having laptops or desktops uh, or even internet access, uh, which we, most of us, I think, have taken for granted in the year 2021 and last year in 2020 when the, when the pandemic was just getting started. Um, this is also money that is based on a Title I formula, not property taxes, but Title I. It's why I said it's the most transformative economic legislation for working families, because this money is being put, is, is, is it an output of a formula that looks at the number of school aged children living below the poverty line. Uh, and it also looks at what the level of uh, poverty concentration is. Uh, and, and, and you get a plus up for that. I was speaking to the chair of the Education and Labor Committee, Bobby Scott, about this. Um, so this is this is extraordinary. We obviously need to make sure that school districts are using this money uh, appropriately. Uh, we should not be seeing, for example, uh, cuts in property taxes as offsets for this significant investment. Uh, that is not the point. The point is to make sure that this money is used effectively. Uh, and also one of the one of the one of the things that it can be used for is to meet the unique needs of of students which i'm also very excited about i mean that's that's pretty broad that's pretty broad so if extracurriculars have been cut you can bring those back that's part of the educational experience that's great to hear and i, I think that's music uh, to the ears of uh, educators and practitioners all across the country usually we're talking about how much of a shortfall we're dealing with and, he, and here there's this great infusion of, of money speaking of infusions of money infrastructure is what's on everybody's mind and if you know if a deal can be had it sounds like there may be more money uh coming into um, the american economy via infrastructure i want to focus on one specific piece of it so there's been five billion dollars in the president's proposal that would go to jurisdictions 
uh, to encourage them to eliminate bans on duplexes and triplexes in order to address you know, what we all know is exorbitant home prices and, and an affordable housing crisis across the country. Um, do you agree with this approach of you know, this, this carrot approach of offering incentives to local areas to change their zoning laws in order to promote more uh, housing integration and affordable housing? Well, look, I mean, the, the challenges of affordable housing are multifaceted. And on the federal level, we need to provide the funds needed so everyone can have a safe and stable place to live. We know that much. Um, and this includes funding for public housing, for Section 8 housing vouchers. I say that as someone who grew up in Section 8 housing. Uh, and for home ownership programs, but we can't build affordable housing at the scale that we need if municipalities do not support the development of affordable housing in their communities. Uh, single family zoning is one of the most significant barriers to this development. Uh, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, when I talked about some of the problems that Westchester has uh, continued to pose uh, to, to integration, uh, it has kept many communities, including many that I represent segregated. Um, and so I think incentives to remove exclusionary zoning like those the Biden administration have put forward are important uh, as are the enforcement of the fair housing laws that already exist. And I'm optimistic with that with my friend, Marsha Fudge at the, at the helm at HUD uh, that we will make significant progress on this. Amazing. Well, so I know uh, you have to leave in a little bit. So I'm wondering, Stefan, do we want to uh, make space for the questions from our, our Bridges friends? Yes, let's do that. And then if we still have a moment, uh, there's one more question, Matt, I'd love for you to get to. But Congressman, we've been told by your staff, there's a, a, a vote on the floor, but we, they told us we got you for another 13 minutes. So we're going to we're going to use our 13 minutes up. Um, and what I want to do here is I actually want to introduce um, uh, a couple of members of our collaborators. So as I said, we're you know, a group of organizations, school districts from all across the country. Um, and two of those organizations are Elm City Communities in New Haven, Connecticut, um, and the Howard County Public Schools in Maryland. Uh, they're both part of our collaborative and we have individuals representing those organizations here today. The first is um, Karen Du Bois Walton and I'll let her introduce herself and ask her question for you, Congressman. Good afternoon, Congressman, it's so nice to see you. I am Karen Du Bois Walton and I serve as the president of Elm City Communities. We are the public housing authority for the city of New Haven, Connecticut. And I am here in the third district represented by your friend, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Um, so it is wonderful to be with you. Yep. Um, and you're speaking my language, talking about housing here. We're trying to do a lot of things to move forward and advance the broadening of affordable housing into more communities. Um, very often the conversation about school and housing desegregation is posed solely from the perspective of how it's a benefit to communities of color. Uh, can you speak to the importance of framing this differently? We all benefit from the great diversity of this country. And what could your message be to white communities around the benefit to their communities and schools? Thank you. You know, we, we've seen time and time again in our history that when people try to deprive black and, and brown communities of resources, they end up depriving all communities of resources. This has been true for public transportation, uh, for parks, for public schools, for higher education, and, and for K through 12 education as well. Um, we live in the richest country in the world and every kid deserves a quality public education. So my message is, and of course there's no easy answer for unwinding the centuries of racism and other forms of discrimination that pose challenges to this, uh, is that people should not be hesitant to desegregate their schools and their communities because this is a distinctly American ideal um, and we need to fight for it, a vision of, di of diversity and prosperity that is available to all. Uh, and I think people want to feel like they're doing the right thing when it comes to that, uh, even if they need encouragement sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you so much, Karen, for being here. I want to invite next Sophia O'Callaghan, who is a student, high school student uh, in Howard County, uh, Maryland. And Sophia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, my name is Sophia Callahan. I'm a junior at River Hill High School in Howard County, Maryland. I've also been researching school integration for the past two years. And my question for you today is regarding school accountability measures, what do you think should be done by the federal government in order to reconcile the harmful effects policy such as No Child Left Behind have had on school equity and integration? Well, I so appreciate your work and I'm so proud of you. Uh, we can start by passing the Strength and Diversity Act. Uh, and, and increase funding and support for public education. 
No Child Left Behind relied on high stakes standardized testing to gauge student proficiency and, and judge school competency. And I think this over reliance on testing really harmed disadvantaged communities, schools that should have received increased resources and support that didn't um, because of low test scores. And many of No Child Left Behind shortcomings were resolved uh, in the passing of the Every Student Succeeds Act. But we need to do more than that. And we need to increase Title I funding and fully fund, by the way, the Indivisibles with Disabilities and Education Act, which is grossly underfunded, is a promise unfulfilled uh, as of yet. Um, we should also be looking at how to invest in creative solutions to close the resource gap between schools and communities of color and their white counterparts. That's why I was so proud to introduce, along with uh, Senator Gillibrand, the Full Service Community Schools Expansion Act, uh, which would provide over $3 billion in grants uh, to the community schools programs uh, the, par through partnerships with local stakeholders to provide wraparound services for students uh, and their families. Uh, Stefan, you're muted. And I am also looking at this TV right now and I actually need to leave the vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, we don't want you to miss your vote. Uh, thank you so wait. much. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And we appreciate your advocacy on this issue. Uh, thank best you. of luck and, 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 and go vote. <laughs> thank you, take care, <laughs> bye. And, uh, and so Matt, um, you know, I was hoping that you and I and, and Karen and Sophia, if they're still here and wanna come back on screen, I was hoping we might be able to just debrief the conversation we heard just, just for a little bit. And the question I'm really interested in posing to, to really to any of you is, you know, what did you hear? What are your takeaways? What resonated with you uh, from what you heard from the congressman uh, about this all important issue? So um, uh, Karen, you look like you're ready to go. You wanna, you wanna answer the question first? Um, sure, there, there was a lot in that that excites me to hear the congressman speaking um, to the issues that we are in collaboration around. Uh, housing and education is, is really fulfilling because he, he certainly understands the issues. Um, the, the, uh, both his bill, the Recovery Act, the infrastructure bill, all that they're recognizing that infrastructure is this broad concept. It is not simply the, the roads and bridges that we have for too long thought about it for infrastructure, but infrastructure really as this as this grid of all these things that we need um, in order to succeed is important to me that 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 be lifted. Um, and then secondly, the flexibility. Um, too often, I think we've been in situations where money has has come um, often to limited dollars, but come with so many strings attached and so many requirements that it's hard to make it work at the local level. And the recognition in, in, in most of this Recovery Act money um, in the kinds of things that are, we anticipate will come and through infrastructure really seem to reflect the, the need to give the local jurisdiction, the local housing authority, the local entity some flexibility around how to best meet um, resident needs. So, so that was important to me. It felt like much more of an equity frame than we often hear. That's really, really insightful. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, Sophia, what, what did you know? What are you taking away from this conversation? What, what resonated with you? Um, something that resonated me as a student was his discussion about the funding and how cutting extracurriculars. I think that having extra opportunities is really important to enrich students' educational experiment experience like education like music art and I feel like as a public school student who's attended public school for the last 12 years I can definitely see an emphasis being moved away from those things and a lot more into you know standardized testing getting into college and stuff like that that's great uh Matt what about yourself yeah lots of thoughts um I think first just I think it's just really incredible to see what it like when you have a uh, elected representatives who are more actually representative of the, 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 the population of our country, you, you get to see public policy that, that as Karen said is designed with an equity frame. Um, and so I, I just think that the, the various pieces of legislation that uh, Representative Jones and others, you know, who are part of, are part of this more new wave of, of congressional leaders, I think it's really like significant. Um, I think, you know, and after we've spent a you know, good four years feeling very depressed about progress and potential, I think this for me like represents opportunity. What I would say also is that while we have are thinking about equity lenses across the broad public policy specter, um, as we're thinking about how to implement 
policies around integration desegregation, that same equity and racial equity lens, I think, needs to be explicit. Um, I think we need to be very careful in, in not demonizing schools that serve majorities of black and brown young people. I went to schools that serve majority black and brown young people. I went to great schools. They also didn't have a lot of resources, right? And so I think we need to be very um, strategic about how we engage and, and, and converse and actually understand that the majority of young people in our public schools are black and brown young people. Um, what, what we do is concentrate privilege and vulnerability in really significant ways. And so I'm just, I'm really excited um, to continue conversations with Representative Jones and others um, who are taking this, you know, taking the policy work towards an equity frame, at, so that those of us on the ground can really implement that and work with uh, our, our legislators to, to move the work forward. That's great. I'm going to share my quick takeaways, and then uh, you know, I'll loop back around for a couple final thoughts. You know, the first thing is is just it's just an incredible to hear someone be so reflective about their own experiences. Uh, and Matt, you alluded to this a little bit, but um, you know, the fact that Congressman grew up in Section 8 housing and knows what that means, what all, you know, everything that comes along with that, the fact that he attended integrated high quality schools and knows what that did for him. And you know, he went, went on to attend Stanford and then Harvard Law. Um, I think those are things that are underappreciated uh, when, when someone can really speak to those experiences personally. The other thing is, and, and Karen, you did such a beautiful job about talking about this is, there's tons of money flowing into schools uh, and housing right now from the federal government. And, and, and the congressman mentioned that some of this is, is, is flexible funding. And you talked a little bit about this, but I think there's a lot of potential for folks to really push the equity conversation and, and even push the integration conversation if the money is used in the right way. Um, because so often in education, we're not talking about how we have all this money to spend. We're talking about how we don't have enough money. And so I think that excites me. The potential of it excites me. I just worry that folks aren't gonna seize the opportunity uh, to use the money in the ways that we know could really make a big difference in, in, in the equity conversation. All right, I have a couple last questions for you all. At, at, for those of you who, uh, who are just joining us, a congressman gave us a good 25 minutes and then had to run to the floor for a vote. We can't, can't, cannot fault him for that. Um, Karen, I wanted to hear if you could, you, know, you run such a, an innovative housing organization, Elm City Communities, it's the, the, the local housing authority in New Haven, can you tell us a little bit more about your work, how it relates to integration, and even some of the collaboration that you have with the local school district there, New Haven Public Schools? Absolutely. We are serving thousands of uh, lower income families in the city of New Haven, which is a um, geographic footprint of about 18 square miles. And we are surrounded by towns that have much, much higher median income uh, and virtually no affordable housing. Um, and so we have, addressed, you know, to Matt's point, we've been doing incredible reinvestment in the city because we will never walk away from the city, from the vibrancy of urban communities, from the need to reinvest in these places that have been underinvested for so long. And we've been doing that to create the highest quality housing within New Haven. But we also need to be looking at what's happening in the surrounding region. One, because we in a city alone cannot meet the need of the region for affordable housing. Um, and two, because families deserve choice. And there are absolutely families who will always choose high quality urban affordable housing. But there are other families who would love to have something affordable in a rural community or a suburban community. And that should be their choice as well. And so we've been really pushing in our legislative advocacy. Um, we've got bills that we're trying to move. We have other bills we're supportive of that can really address the zoning impediments that the congressman spoke to um, around single family exclusive zoning and incredible lot size zoning and other things that have restricted affordable housing. So that as this money that may come in around infrastructure and development comes in, it, we're, we're not receiving this money and then blocked from opportunities to try to develop in other places. So we've been doing that, um, but we're not just about the bricks and mortar. We're about the families that live with us. And so we invest in families in terms of their, um, their highest education opportunities for their young people. Um, we, we meet the adults where they are around their goals. And so that has put us in partnership with our New Haven Public Schools um, and other education entities in our area to really be a partner um, with families so that we can help close some of the gaps, help with the communication sharing, um, help provide some of the resource that will help them graduate their kids ready for the next level and not needing to apply for our wait list for themselves because they are undereducated or, or not prepared for their future workforce. It's incredible, incredible work you're doing there. 
Last question goes to Sophia, and then I'm gonna you know, leave it open for people to have their closing statements, closing remarks here. Sophia, you live in Howard County, uh, and Howard County just uh, underwent a redistricting effort. Can you just tell us a little bit about it? What was it trying to accomplish? What did it accomplish? And what are your thoughts on it? Of course, um, Howard County last year recently went through a redistricting effort to achieve more socioeconomically integrated schools. A lot of schools had high concentration of free and reduced lunch students compared to other schools who had very low concentrations. I don't believe it was as successful as it was intended to be because there was a lot of backlash from the community. I still think that it was important despite the backlash that Howard County went through the with the redistricting and kind of sent through the message that they prioritize integration and they prioritize diversity in their schools and racial equity as well. Fantastic. Uh, really well said. Um, you know, it's really an honor to have both of you here. Uh, let's open it up for last words um, about this topic, uh, about this conversation today, and then, and then we'll close this thing out. So um, why don't we, uh, I'll just open it up. Last word. I'll just say, I think we are at a moment and we can't miss this moment. Um, there is a, a lot of focus on equity and there are, are so many partners who are willing to lead and demonstrate what it means to um, move forward with, a, with an equity frame. And we've got a uh, new uh, federal direction and we've got um, nationwide sort of energy around this. And so this is an opportunity to really make some big strides forward around housing and education. And let's not miss that moment. Sophia, last word. Yeah, going off what Karen said, I'm really glad to see a lot of progress when it comes to integration. I've been researching integration for the past two years and I love to see that there's new federal legislation in progress. And I think that as a student, I find it really important to see that all my peers are being valued by the education system, not just those who are white and upper class. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez, last word. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone, for being a part of the conversation and, and inviting me to join. Uh, just a couple of things. I think um, Sophia and Representative Jones, I think we all kind of alluded to the fact that some of this work is hard um, and that it, it, it incurs backlash. Um, and it, 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 you know, we're in a moment where we have a lot of opportunity, as Karen said, on the on the horizon. Um, I think this this um, however, we also have a, a world of backlash that I think is is, is ready, uh, has not gone away from the, you know, folks chasing buses with rocks in the 50s and 60s. And so um, I, I encourage us all to, to continue building coalition and community together um, so that we can face this backlash, which will no matter what's going to come, um, but we can face it together. One, one invitation I'll offer is um, this Saturday from on th at 3 p.m., the National Coalition on School Diversity um, will be hosting a, a screening of a play called Nothing About Us, which was a play about seg educational segregation written by New York City public high school students. Um, really, you know, what we've done here is really try to ground the discussion in the voices of young people and those directly impacted by this, the harm of segregation. Uh, so we'll, we'll share all the info, but um, the more we can keep talking about this as a community um, and, and not just within our communities, but across the country, um, let's keep doing that. So thanks TCF and NCSD for continuing to keep the national dialogue going. Um, and I'll pass back to you. Thank you so much. So this is where I, I close things out and just want to give a personal thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you so much. You, you did a fantastic job today and you continue to do such a great job of advocating for this issue in New York and, and really all across the country. Um, Karen, thank you so much for your leadership uh, in New Haven and um, for your incredible responses today. Sophia, thank you for your leadership in Howard County and your tremendous responses today. I couldn't have thought of uh, a better group of people to, to debrief this conversation with. We wanna thank again, Congressman Mondaire Jones uh, and his entire office for helping us put this event together. He gave some incredible answers to, to some of these questions and just displayed a real depth of knowledge around the, the issue of integration in both schools and in housing. Uh, and I said this in the chat to him, but I really hope that uh, all of our representatives in Congress uh, understand this issue as deeply as he does. Uh, if so, it really bodes well for what can happen in the next few years. Um, as I said at the beginning, this event was hosted, uh, co-hosted by the National Coalition on School Diversity, um, the Poverty and, Research, uh, Poverty and Race Research Action Council, and of course, the Century Foundation and the Bridges Collaborative, which is uh, a, 
an organization that was launched last year to be a hub for practitioners across the country. We've got 57 organizations, school districts, charter schools, and housing organizations from across the country who come together regularly to collaborate on this issue and move the issue of school integration forward. Uh, we've done some tremendous work thus far. We look forward to doing more tremendous work in the future. Um, with that, uh, I'm gonna adjourn everybody. This, will, this has been recorded. It will be posted at tcf.org. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Have a great evening, everybody.